Good morning everyone and welcome to the 101st Learn with Lorna where we'll be looking at the McLean Sisters collection. My name is Lorna Steele McGinn. I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service. Highland Archive Service has four centres where we look after the historic documents of the Highlands. We have the Highland Archive and Registration Centre in Inverness. We have Nucleus, the Nuclear and Caithness Archives in Wick. Loch Aber Archive Centre in Port William and Sky and Loch Alsh Archive Centre in Portree. This series is brought to you by High Life Island at no cost to the viewer. High Life Island's a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then we're very grateful for that. And there's a link to be able to do so in the body of the text of this film. So welcome to the second century of Learn with Lorna, and I'm sorry that the first one is pre-recorded. Uh, that's because I am going to work at a local primary school to support them in World Book Day, and so this one is pre-recorded. But thank you for, as I always say, for all your support up to this point, and for the first uh, 100 episodes, and all your lovely messages and uh, things that you have sent to me to mark that. I've been very grateful for that. So a new century, a new month and a new theme today. This month we're going to be looking at the subject of women in the Highlands and Islands and right across all four of our Facebook pages there'll be content and information about women represented in the collections that we care for. And as part of this, my Learn with Lorna's for this month will look at uh, women in the Keith Ness collections, women in the Sky Loch Alsh collections and in the Loch Aber collections. And also we'll be releasing the interview that I had with Professor Dame Sue Black on the 8th of March to mark International Women's Day. But this week I wanted to start by looking at a family of sisters, the four McLean sisters. This is deposited collection D171, McLean Family Correspondence. The collection dates from 1904 to 1959 and it comprises two boxes, so a smaller collection than many of the ones that we've looked at and a smaller date range. But I think you'll agree by the time we come to the end of this, that within that small collection, there are some extraordinary stories of some amazing women. To start with a little bit of context about the family, the, the four sisters, their father was the Reverend Norman Maclean, who was born in Skye. He was a minister uh, of the Church of Scotland, and he took on the roles of the moderator of the General Assembly in 1927, the General Assembly being the highest court of the Church of Scotland. So that's the annual meeting of decision making, which determines uh, church policy and direction. So he became the moderator, the head of the General Assembly in 1927. In addition to that, he also took on the role of, of uh, being a king's chaplain. And he travelled extensively through a range of countries, including Palestine, Israel, uh, Australia, Canada, America and throughout Africa. And it's interesting that the family has a very strong church connection and, as you can see there, that connection to travel. Um, but the church connection was manifest in various ways. So his brother, Norman's brothers, uh, John and George, were also both ministers. In 1895, Norman Maclean married Jane Macaulay, uh, who was called Sheena. Uh, it seemed like I do that every week that I say this is the person's name and this is what they get called. So this time uh, Jane Macaulay is the mother and she is known as Sheena. The family connection to the church was kind of further reinforced by that marriage because Sheena was the daughter of the Reverend Donald Macaulay, minister of Ray in Caithness. And the couple had four daughters. Jean Robertson McLean, who was born in around 1897. Helen Alexa McLean, born again in the late 1890s. Uh, Jeelush, and again, as I will always say, my Gaelic is, uh, Gaelic is not my first language, so I believe the pronunciation is Jeelus. Jeelus McLean, who was born in 1903, and Margaret Hope McLean, born in 1908. And it's these four women that we're going to be looking at today. Now let's start with Jean. Jean Robertson Maclean was born, as I said, in around 1897. After finishing school, she went on to the University of Edinburgh, following her aspirations of becoming a doctor. And after graduating in the 1910s, she went on to specialise in several areas, initially in surgery 
and the practice of anaesthetics. Jean went on to work at several hospitals across the UK and we have correspondence from her from this period from different places. There are letters from her time working in a hospital in Dublin. She doesn't seem to have been in Dublin for very long but she still tried to acquire an Irish accent because she so much enjoyed listening to it. She complained in one letter from Dublin that only she and one other person had an exploring nature and she was very unimpressed about the fact that uh, no one else was up for exploring and adventuring so she and one friend did uh, went adventuring together. Jean spent time at the South London Hospital for Women which is an extraordinary um, institution which I had known nothing about until I came to look into this. It had only been founded a few years before Jean went there and of course it's relatively early still to be a, a female doctor. The South London Hospital for Women only employed female staff and it only treated women and children. So it had the joint aim of first of all giving women career prospects within medicine because other hospitals wouldn't employ female doctors and also a second remit of encouraging knowledge of and ability to treat specific women's illnesses and specific needs that women might face. So a very interesting organisation and she obviously made a huge impact during her time there because this was her reference when she left. This is written by the senior surgeon. I have much pleasure in testifying to the excellent work done by Miss Jean R. McLean as house surgeon at the South London Hospital for Women. Miss McLean at this hospital had charge of all the surgical cases. These were partly general ward and partly private ward cases, all of them surgical and most of them major operation cases. Miss McLean has an extremely sound, thoroughly good and up-to-date knowledge of her profession, both theoretical and practical. She is careful, thorough and responsible in her work, of which she always has a thorough grip. She was liked equally by patients, nurses and students and by her superior officers. We are very sorry to lose her services at this hospital. During the last 20 years, I have had many house surgeons, many of them very good, none better than Miss McLean. I wish her every success in her application for an appointment and I am sure that any hospital appointing her will gain a valuable and loyal officer. So really, quite an extraordinary reference and that was written by one of the hospital's founders. She went to spend uh, three years then at the Bolton Infirmary in Lancashire where she worked as a house surgeon and as a resident surgical officer. The hospital had over 250 beds and carried out around 2,000 major oper surgical operations every year and she was in charge of many, if not all, of those. If her references from London were good, the ones from Bolton, this time written by a man, which may well have been relevant at the time, uh, were absolutely positively glowing references, praising her exceptional surgical skill level, her level-headedness, her tact and efficiency, the way that she handled patients and staff. Mr G. L. Faulkner, who was the honorary uh, consulting surgeon, described her as the most satisfactory resident the hospital had had in 15 years, saying that everything ran smoothly and efficiently under her guidance and that she was the best anaesthetist that the hospital had had for a very, very long time. So quite something, uh, quite pioneering and quite an extraordinary range of references. And that reference at that time uh, came to Jean in 1924, very important timing for her as she used that particular reference to embark on her next big adventure, which was going to work and teach in hospitals in India in 1924. We have letters describing the journey. She describes uh, taking the ship and playing deck tennis, the fact that she gets involved in a game of bridge but she hopes they never ask her again because they're all rubbish at playing bridge and she doesn't want to do it again. She describes all the crew. So we have this really sort of vivid um, description of her journey to India. And Jean seems to have been as successful there as she was everywhere else. 
Uh, we have letters written which contain details about her experiences, the diversity of the classes that she taught, her preference for surgery over students, and a range of other things. And I wanted to share with you just a couple, um, a couple of extracts from those letters. She describes the fact that she's been ill and it's complicating matters, that it's much harder to work when I feel ill. However, she says, I'm practically all right now and I'm back at work. I'm doing my best to take things easy so that I may quickly reaccumulate my usual store of vigour. Uh, she says uh, that the weather's changing and it's starting to, to uh, um, be splendid now, but she says that she didn't uh, re realise when she was in Skye how much she should have been grateful for the weather there, as she's now getting too hot all the time. She says, I'm beginning to find the work easier, but even if one were well up on one's subject, it would be quite a heavy job, especially the first year when one had to, pre had to prepare so many lectures. And I think it says seven lectures a week she had to prepare. It, it may be a three, but I think it's a seven. She says, it's the preparation that I find the worst part of it. I speak for a whole hour on, uh, and really, I find that to speak for a whole hour, one really has to prepare an awful lot. And anatomy is not a subject that permits poddling or fight flights of fancy. The actual lecturing and work among the students I quite enjoy. I don't object to the sound of my own voice and I can always keep my pupils' attention. I think they quite like me and I think they don't realise from what a thin layer of knowledge I teach them. But I don't think I shall want to do it for more than a year. Patients really rather appeal to me more than students. Besides, I want to go on with operating. One gets awfully out of it if one stops for long. And she goes on to say, you know, thank you for your letter. Thank you for keeping me up to date with the news from Sky. So something that we've seen in many collections, that uh, importance of the link to home. This is another extract. She says, I want to go to church. Uh, I want to go to church this evening, but a case came in and I had to stay and do a caesarean section. The mother was a poor little girl of 15 or 16 who was in a very bad condition. And she said that the girl has a, a disease there that is quite common. Um, which results in a softening of the bones. She says the cause of it isn't known, but it's thought that maybe it's due to lack of fresh air and sunshine. The operation went off all right, and I was highly commended by the little nurse who gave the anaesthetic, who told me that I had only taken 20 minutes to perform the caesarean section. I, Of course, I'm not a medical historian. I have no idea at what point caesareans became very common, but it struck me that probably at the beginning of the 1920s, they probably weren't that frequent. It's clear that Jean's father was very proud of her. In, in 1920, he visited Balmoral Castle and he recorded in a letter to Jean a conversation he had had with Princess Mary and the Queen, who was Queen Mary, uh, King George V's wife. And Princess Mary, like Jean, had was around 23 at this time and was very impressed with Jean's cleverness and the fact that the man she was speaking to had a daughter the same age as her who was a doctor. And we can also see a glimpse in this letter, in this recorded conversation with the royal family, about Jean's future career and aspirations. Her father tells Queen Mary and Princess Mary that she's thinking of taking up children's welfare work. And she would go on to do just that. She worked in children's welfare and she went on to publish articles about her work in journals, including the Journal of the Association of Medical Women in India. And she wrote a history of maternity and child welfare in Bengal. There's a great letter from the editor of um, the journal, the Association of Medical Women in India, that critiques an article of genes and says, I will say nothing about the spelling mistakes and the genish words. She also seemed to dedicate a fair amount of time to fundraising for the hospital that she was working at. And there are many letters that, that say what a huge amount of work she's doing to, to enable the hospital to be taken forward. And you can see that right back in those early references about her administration skills, her practical skills, her level-headedness, her efficiency in organising would have come in very useful in that kind of fundraising work. She also, uh, married while she was in, in India, uh, a man called Alan Bigger. 
And as the Second World War hit, it seems, I don't have a huge amount of information about this, but it seems that her skills were probably further utilised because some letters go on to describe her as Captain Jane Bigger and uh, Jean Bigger and then as Major Jane Bigger. So that's Jean. I think you'll agree, quite an extraordinary story. So that's one sister. In the meantime, what were the other sisters doing? Well, let's have a look at Helen next. Now, Helen didn't have quite the extensive travel bug that Jean did. She settled in Edinburgh and she wrote frequently to Jean, particularly when their mother died in 1927, when, of course, the girls were all still fairly young. She was very sympathetic to the fact that Jean wasn't, was in India and wasn't able to be there for her mother's illness or for her mother's funeral. Although she does note in one letter to Jean, at least you're able to remember her strong and healthy, while the rest of us will remember her as frail and weak and very thin. Helen seems to have suffered from a low opinion of her own ability, and she sought help about this. And she wrote this letter to Jean. Um, she says, I think, I feel I was right to get to get a car and to take the chance of really learning to drive, although to an outsider it must seem madness to have embarked on such an orgy of spending on nothing. You see, I wouldn't have learnt driving in 12 lessons because I'm slow at things like driving, slow at learning, I mean. I find that the analysis has helped me almost beyond words in attacking difficult things. It's almost amazing to me. First, I accept that the fact that in certain essentially practical things, I am slow and I find them very difficult. Then, having looked at the fact from all angles, I know now that I can learn things, although perhaps it will just be very slowly. I see the slowness doesn't matter. And when I feel depressed over the slowness, then I remember all the things I can do well. And I look at those things with smug pleasedness. And then I return to keep trying the things that I can't do. I love that. I love that extract. Just to say, maybe I'm not great at doing everything, but I just persevere at it until I can do it. And Helen did indeed learn to drive and during World War II those hard-earned skills that she really tried so hard to achieve came into their own because she became an emergency driver and then went on to take on a role in the Ministry of, Ed uh, of Information. This is an extract from a letter she's writing to Jean explaining what she's been up to. I've taken on an emergency spot of work if air raids are back, I'm an emergency driver under military orders for the time of the emergency, so I'll be in the thick of it, much better than having nothing to do but listen to bombs falling. I'm also, uh, I'm also, I'm stumbling over my words, I am also on the advisory committee of the Ministry of Information in Scotland and will go out with a loudspeaker van to help keep up the morale of the nation. I only hope our own morale is good. So from that kind of first letter of saying, I'm slow at learning things, I'm not good at doing things. She's become an emergency driver. She's gone on to work for the Ministry of Information. And that skill that seems to be inherent in the family for teaching and writing and communicating obviously ran into Helen as well. She published articles in support of the National Labour Party, including this paragraph which I thought was incredibly relevant to share with you today and made me feel quite emotional. She writes in this published article, one of the most cheering things in the world, one of the most cheering things in a world that is in need of cheer is what can be done by a handful of people with a clear motive, courage and enthusiasm. It is a great force, a force greater than battleships, guns or great armies. She also wrote some very powerful words uh, to her sister about the need sometimes to stand up and take firm action in the face of brutality and cruelty in order to achieve something for humanity. Helen's ability to communicate also led to her being asked to host a series of meetings in the West Highlands for the Ministry of Education. And this is uh, an extract of a, a reference that she was given at around about this time for her work. I have known Miss, Miss Helen McLean for several years. 
and I consider that she has a remarkably good and a, a remarkably good and lovely mind, much sympathy, energy, a great working power. Her steadfastness of purpose and her driving force ought to be valuable to any organisation whose work she undertakes. So again, that um, image coming through of the, the focus and determination and a work ethic of the family. Helen also went on to broadcast on BBC Children's Hour and also on the BBC more widely. And in a letter to Jean, she describes um, the, the work that she does in preparing for a talk entitled The Highlands in Wartime. She says that they were very pleased with her script and that she really enjoyed doing the research for it. And she says, sitting talking softly to oneself really is always a pleasant thing to do. Um, and I felt as I, an affinity with her as I was reading that because I thought, yeah, I, you know, I spend a lot of my time writing, preparing, researching talks for Learn with Lorna and for a range of other things. And it is a very pleasant thing to do. It's very satisfying to immerse yourself in a subject, to communicate that subject and to see people's pleasure come back to you. She says, I got large fan mail from every part. She describes her sisters, all of her sisters, bursting with pride at the fact that she had been on the radio with a script she had written herself. And she says, I clearly seem to have an electrifying effect on people. And what's key here is it's obviously making a huge difference to her because she says, I have no horrid dreams anymore and I've even put on weight. She says it seems wrong to feel happy when the world is in such a hell of a mess, but maybe by me just being happy, I can make a small difference to the world. Which again, I thought was very beautiful and very relevant because I have felt like that in the last couple of weeks doing Learn With Lorna, that it feels lighthearted, it feels frivolous. Um, but perhaps in a time of fear and worry and pressure for the world, we can bring a bit of joy to each other through things like this. So that's Jean and Helen. So we're on to the third sister, uh, Gilas. She followed in Jean's footsteps, becoming a doctor. Really interesting to me that the previous generation had that heavy involvement with the church, but this generation, the focus seems to be very much on medicine and on social reform and social care. Helen wrote a letter to Jean in India and she said, if you saw Gilas, you would, re you would realise she was exactly the same. T pretty, tender-hearted, hiding this fact firmly. Brusque, pretending she needs no help but needing it. Talking rot she does not mean. Which I just thought was an absolutely classic sibling assessment. When World War II broke out, Helen recorded in a letter to Jean that, uh, that Gilas was... She said she has high war fever. She's longing to be in uniform. She's longing to do something and contribute. And then we have letters between Gilas and Jean, and they show the sisters mutual interest in medical work and particularly in work involving children and child psychology. And this was put to good use in 1940, when Gilas became one of the doctors on a panel of doctors who would go backwards and forwards to America and Canada with evacuated children. Her hun husband at that point joined the Home Guard, so very much a contribution to the war, to the war effort. In January 1941, Gilas wrote to her sister Jean about the new job that she had been given. And she says here, she's talking about the fact that they've lost a huge amount. They've lost books, they've lost furniture, uh, in, I assume in the Blitz, because she's based in the south of England at this point. But then she says, but of course, other people have lost everything. At any rate, she says, not long after November, I had the great good luck to be appointed as assistant medical officer uh, of health to Essex. With a salary of £500 and I've got a wee Morris 8 for which I get threepence a mile. My job is mainly school inspection work and I have a lovely big country area around Ongar in Essex. I also lead antenatal clinics, very few. Um, and she goes on to say very few that there are, thank goodness there are very few antenatal clinics um, and child welfare centres up and down. And I've been allowed to start two child guidance clinics 
in connection with the school children's clinics. She says that uh, another one of the doctors is terribly keen on them and therefore she's allowed to do exactly as she likes with them. It's a grand job, she says. Quite extraordinary that we now have one pioneering doctor working uh, in women's health and working in India, one sister um, doing all that, that work for the Ministry of Information, and this third sister being uh, again a doctor and becoming the assistant um, um, the assistant for public health in the county of Essex and running all these clinics. And she goes on to describe to Jean the impact that the war was having on the children that she came into contact with. This is a letter she says here. The long and weary night raids were a great trial, um, but mostly where they were bravely borne by everyone. Only a very few children have been affected by the raids and these were a those who have been uh, those with nervous parents, or B, those who lived through the terrific raids early in September of last year, and who have been or who have been where a direct hit took place. In these cases, you usually get quite a serious amount of mental trauma, prolonged over weeks or months, also a marked increase in fear during sub subsequent raids for a long period. Again, something that seems very, very prevalent, uh, very relevant right now. This is another extract where she describes her work with children. And again, she's telling Jean, so there's that medical knowledge between the sisters. She says, well, now to work. Well, there was no psychological work in done, in, done in Essex at all. But I started two clinics in December, one in my country area and one in Romford. I pick out some of the cases for myself at my medical inspections at the schools. Others are sent to me by headmistresses of various schools. Others are sent by medical officers and a few from the CMO, public assistant board, etc. I get a big variety of cases, mostly maladjustments in older children and the vast majority of these due to bad relationships between parents or between children and parents or both. So pioneering work in the field of child psychology. She says to Jean, I've led 80, ch I've, I've led 80 child guidance cases in 1941, which I think is not bad on top of all the other work that I do. It's not bad, is it? I mean, I think we can agree it's not bad at all. Finally, let's look at Margaret, the last sister and equally extraordinary. Margaret was educated in Edinburgh and in Switzerland, and by all accounts, was always a very independent and strong-willed child. And that's referenced several times throughout the letters that um, you'll not you'll not mess with her. Some one of her sisters describes her as being um, she'll always be very hot or very cold, but she'll never be in the middle. She spent her childhood holidays in Skye, as I mentioned at the beginning, their very strong family connection to Skye, and of course her, her father was from there. And so they spent their childhood holidays there, and this was very important and formative for Margaret in particular. She went to Edinburgh University and went on to marry Duncan McPherson, who was the son of a crofter who had lived just up the road from that childhood family home in Skye. The marriage was seen by her father as very much below her. And we hold letters in which the sisters and their father detail their feelings about this um, relationship. And here is Margaret's letter, again to Jean in India. Jean seems to be the central figure they're all writing backs and forwards to because of course she was away. And this is Margaret's letter describing her engagement to Duncan and how she was going to handle her father's feelings about it. Dear Jean, I have rather astounding news for you this week, although astounding to you, but um, but old news to us. I am going to marry Duncan McPherson. I've had it in mind now ever since I returned from Switzerland, but things have come in the way. Now we are being married at the end of May. We had contemplated diverse ways of doing it, from running away to Duncan talking to Daddy, but as it fell out, I told Treasure, who as a neutral party, was most was most able to speak to dad about it. He's feared it for some time. I suppose he was not very surprised, although quite as displeased as one could expect. 
He believes Duncan a fool, but he says, uh, but he lets me have my, uh, he says, that he, she says, he believes Duncan to be a fool. He always lets me have my way. He will attend our marriage, provided we wait till the end of May and Duncan has a house ready for me, both quite sensible conditions. And as I wish to give the best appearance I can to the transaction, I have agreed to everything, even to being booted off to Aloha for reasons unknown. You will think this folly, and very likely you're right. Still, I feel I cannot know my own mistakes until I have made them. Perhaps I shall. Ha perhaps I have an absurd faith in Duncan. I shall not shake it by not marrying him. I don't suppose we will ever have much money, but our way of living can be by corresponding, uh, can be correspondingly simpler. I shall probably be lonely, but I might also be that by earning my own living, and I have no fancy at all for an academic career. Such opposition to other people's views is not pleasant, and yet I feel this is my own business. I shall certainly pay the penalty for this, if there is one. Is it a poor turn to my father for his years of care? Yes, indeed, and my children will quite possibly disregard my wishes in an equally ungrateful fashion. Don't blame me too much, Jean, will you? I don't have anything more to say. To, and then she says, don't have anything more to do with me if it's easier not to. Quite extraordinary. She would say later on in her life that her father cut her off and never talked to her again as a result of marrying below her. Duncan Macpherson and Margaret, uh, as I say, got married and they settled in Skye where Margaret became heavily involved in issues around land management, politics and crofting. In 1945, she defeated Sir Godfrey Fell at the polls, which resulted in her election to Inverness County Council, representing Portree. She would go on to become secretary of the Skye Labour Party. Margaret was an active campaigner on a number of issues. She joined the Sky Peace Centre and campaigned actively for nuclear disarmament. But perhaps the thing that led to her greatest legacy happened, uh, apart from her seven sons, um, her greatest legacy perhaps came with something that came about in 1951, when she was appointed to the Commission in, uh, of Inquiry into Crofting Conditions, which would become known as the Taylor Commission. Margaret took an active part in this commission. She argued for the nationalisation of all farms over 3,000 acres and against crofters purchasing their own crofts because she believed that rather than individual ownership, community ownership was the way forward for Sky and the crofting communities. That crofters, uh, the commission's report was published in 1954 and led to the establishment of the Crofters Commission, which is the regulatory board, uh, the body for crofting in Scotland. So she has been involved in politics, in land management issues, in campaigning for nuclear disarmament. And as if all enough, all of that wasn't enough, that family talent for communication and writing didn't pass Margaret either. She went on to present and produce, uh, present and take part in programmes for the BBC, and she wrote a series of children's books inspired by Highland history and culture, such as the book The Shinty Boys. I think you'll agree with me that they are an extraordinary set of sisters, doctors and politicians, um, people working for social improvement, for the improvement of children's lives, for the improvement of crofters' lives quite a, an extraordinary range of things. They, uh, many of them, several of them married and went on to have children, uh, but I wanted to talk particularly today about them in their own right and what they had achieved uh, in their own capacities. So I hope you've enjoyed that story uh, and been interested to hear about the McLean sisters. Next week, uh, on Tuesday, I hope you can uh, take part in the launch of the interview that I have had with Professor Dame Sue Black. I've mentioned it before, a huge privilege, uh, something I'm very, very proud to have done. And so there's my interview with Sue Black will go live 
throughout that day and then will be available afterwards for International Women's Day, Tuesday the 8th of March, and a corresponding blog will go up on our website that day as well. And then next Thursday, I'll see you back here for uh, a look at this collection of Mary Beath, who was a herbalist and writer. So I hope you can enjoy me, uh, join me for that. And I really hope you've enjoyed this week's. Please do uh, comment on it and I will pick those up when I return from being at World Book Day. So thank you so much for watching and taking part. This series is brought to you by High Life Island at no cost to the viewer. High Life Island is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. If you're able to donate towards our work, then we're very, very grateful for that. Thank you so much.